All right, this is the unit four review. First two questions come from section 5.1. This is called finding a particular solution. What that means is we use indefinite integration to find the antiderivative and then find the particular value of C using this initial condition. So let's first start by using indefinite integration. You need to find the antiderivative of the square root of x. So essentially we need to find the antiderivative of x to the one half dx. So using rules of integration, we add one to the exponent and then divide by it. So if you add one to one half, you're going to get three halves. And then if you divide by three halves, that's the same as multiplying by two thirds. And then we add C. So this is our antiderivative f of x. Now we're given an, up, an x value here of 9. So this is what x equals. And this value, we know that f of x equals 4. So if we plug those values in now, a 9 for x. and then a four for f of x, that's gonna allow us to find that missing value of c. So starting here, nine to the three halves, well that's the square root of nine, which is three, and then three cubed is 27. So this is two thirds times 27, plus c equals four. Two thirds of 27 is 18. And if you subtract 18 on both sides, you get a value at c equals negative 14. So then we know that f of x equals 2 thirds x to the 3 halves minus 14. So we're going to do a similar thing here on question two. We need to find the antiderivative of 4x plus 2. So it's going to be 4x squared over 2 plus 2x. So we know that f of x equals 2x squared plus 2x plus c. Using the same thing, we know that x equals negative 2, and f of x equals 1. So we can make the substitutions. Uh, negative 2 squared is 4, 4 times 2 is 8, and then 8 minus 4 is 4, so we have 4 plus c. So c equals negative 3. So the particular solution is 2x squared plus 2x minus 3. Now 5.2 is when we learned about substitution, u substitution, in particular with the general power rule. So if you remember, the general power rule is u to the power of n du. <clears throat> the antiderivative is u to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c. That's the general power rule. So what we need to do is figure out an inside function for u for each of these. So I'm looking at right here an inside function. So we could say that u is equal to x cubed minus 2. Then if we take the derivative, that's 3x squared dx. And we've got the 3x squared and the dx. So that antiderivative can turn into 
instead of x cubed minus 2 to the third power, it's u to the third du. And the antiderivative of u to the third is u to the fourth over 4. So now we can undo the substitution for u and call it x to the third minus 2 to the fourth power all over 4 plus c. Now for number 4, I see an inside function here. And then we can also change the cube root. We can change that into a power of 1 third. So I'm going to say that u is the inside function 5x to the third minus 1. So then du is 15x squared dx. So we're supposed to have a 15x squared dx. I've got the x squared and the dx, but I've got a 45 right there. Well, 45 is 15 times 3. So if I split the 45 and lift a 15 and then pull the 3 out of it, then I'd have the 15x squared. So I can call this 3 and then u to the 1 3rd du. And this 3 is just a coefficient, so it's going to stay a 3. The antiderivative of get back there. The antiderivative of u to the one-third is u to the four-thirds, and then we either divide by four-thirds or multiply by three-fourths. So this three times three there, that's going to become a 27. So 27 27, what am I talking about? That's 9. I'm thinking 3 to the third power. 3 times 3 is 9. Time to wake up. Alright, 3 times 3 is 9, and then we can undo the u substitution, which is 5x to the third minus 1. That's raised to the 4 thirds power divided by 4 plus c. Five point three. we learned uh, two other rules using u substitution. Exponential rule was e to the u, du is e to the u. And then the logarithm rule was the antiderivative of du over u is the natural log of u. So those are the two rules that we learned in 5.3. So it looks like number five is going to be following the, the logarithm rule because it's in the form of a fraction, so that means the denominator we could let equal u du would be 6x dx. So we've got the x dx in the numerator, because remember we're supposed to try to have a du in the in the numerator. But we got an 18 and it's supposed to be a 6. Well, 18 is 6 times 3, so I could leave a 6 there and pull a 3 out, that'll give me the 18, uh, and then the 6dx like I need. So I can call this the antiderivative of du over u, because du is 6x dx, and u is 3x squared plus 4. Well, the antiderivative of du over u is natural log of u, so this is 3 times the natural log of the absolute value of u, And then undo your u substitution. So number six, we have e raised to a power, so we could try to let that power be our u. So u is equal to x to the third plus four. So du would be three x squared dx. We've got the x squared dx. But it's supposed to be 3x squared, not negative 6. But negative 6 could be 3 
times negative two. So I left the three there and put the negative two out there. That would be that would be negative six, and it would also be the three x squared that I need. So I can change this into e to the u du, and the antiderivative of e to the u is e to the u. And then you can undo the u substitution and leave it like that. Okay. Number seven's probably going to be a lot like number five. We can try du over u. u would be the denominator, du would be the derivative of that, which is going to be 25x to the fourth. So I've got the x to the fourth dx, but that negative 75 should be a positive 25. So instead of a negative 75, I could say this 25 with a negative 3 out front. So then this changes into negative 3 times the antiderivative of du over u. which is the antiderivative of du over u is natural log of u. And then you can undo the u substitution for the answer. Okay, we have e to a power, so we can try the e to the u, the exponential rule, which means the power would be our u. So we've got the x and the dx, but that 6x is supposed to be a 2x. So the 6 I can change into a 2 multiplied by a 3. So now we've got e to the u du. Okay, those all have been examples of indefinite integration. 5.4, we learned about the fundamental theorem of calculus, definite integration, helped us find the area under a curve. Uses the same uh, ways of integration, so substitution rule up until this point. And we just apply the fundamental theorem of calculus after we find the antiderivative. So, what we're going to do on number nine is rewrite the integral. And I'm going to bring the expression in the denominator up to the numerator. This will be um, an example of the general power rule. So we have u to the power of n. So <clears throat> that means u is going to be the inside function x minus 2 du is 1 dx. So that 5 just needs to be moved out in front. And I'm going to drop the limits of integration until we find the antiderivative. So this is u to the power of negative 2 du. The antiderivative of u to the negative 2 is u to negative 1 divided by negative 1. So that's the same as negative 5 over u, which is negative 5 
over x minus 2. Now we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. With our bounds of integration, we always start with the upper bound. So that's negative 5 over 5 minus 2. And then we subtract the antiderivative evaluated at the lower bound. That would be negative 5 over 3 minus 2. So this is negative 5 thirds plus 5. <clears throat> 5 is the same as 15 thirds, so negative 5 thirds plus 15 thirds is 10 thirds. For number 10, we're going to try the, the uh, exponential rule because we have e to a power. So we could say that u is equal to that power. So then du would be the derivative, which is 2dx. We've got the 2 and the dx. All that needs to change is that minus sign just going to be move out front. So again, I'm going to drop the bounds of integration and just so I don't have to write them. I'm just going to find the antiderivative. So we've got that negative, and then the 2 e to the 2x plus 6 can become e to the u du. The antiderivative is e to the u. So that's negative e to the 2x plus 6. We're going to evaluate that from negative 3, negative 6. So we start with the upper limit. So it's going to be the opposite of e to the negative 6 plus 6. That's 0 minus the opposite of e to the negative 12 plus 6. That's negative 6. Now here, e to the 0, that's just 1, so we have negative 1 plus e to negative 6, which is negative, oops, negative 1 plus 1 over e to the 6. All right, section 5.5 was an extension, really a 5.4. We're still using fundamental theorem of calculus to find the area, uh, but this time the area is bounded by two graphs. So first thing we need to find on number 11 uh, are the intersection points of the graph. Where does this first one, I'm gonna call this uh, y1, where does it intersect with y2? So a quick way of finding that is to set the two functions equal to each other. And then solve for x. So I'm going to get one side equal to 0. And you can factor out an x. and then continue to factor. So we have x equals 0, x equals negative 2, and x equals 1. Um, so this is uh, a little unusual that we have three points of intersection. So what's happening here? We don't need to graph it, but I'll do my best. It's it's a cubic, so you know I'm, I might look. Well, let's try that again. It might look something like that, and then we have an upside down parabola, negative x squared. So you know it could look something like that, an upside down parabola. So what we actually have are two bounded regions. And, and this graph isn't exact, I'm just drawing examples. So we have this region here and this region here. That's why we have one, two, 
three spots where these graphs intersect. So for example, negative two to zero and then zero to positive one. So after you find where the graphs intersect, you need to figure out which one is the upper function, which one is the lower function. I'm going to use my example here, and again, remember this may not be what these graphs actually look like. Um, but between here and here, we've got the x to the third function that's on top, and then the x squared function is underneath, but then it switches at this intersection point to this intersection point. Now the x squared is up top, and the x to the third function is underneath. So we need to figure out which function is the top function and which function is the bottom function in between each of those points of intersection. So um, I'm going to start between 0, well, between negative 2 and 0. So I'm going to try to figure that one out. So between x equals negative 2 and x equals 0, what you need to do is choose a number between those. So between x equals negative 2 and x equals 0 um, would be something like x equals negative 1. And you plug that into both functions. So y1 at x equals negative 1. So if I plug in x equals negative 1 into y1 here, I'm going to get negative 1 cubed. That's negative 1. And then negative 4 times negative 1 is positive 4. So that's going to give me a 3. y1, or sorry, y2 now. We already did y1. y2 at x equals negative 1. So now we go up to y2. So if I plug in negative 1 and square it, that's going to be 1. But then you multiply it by that negative. So it's negative 1. And then minus 2 times negative 1. That's plus 2. So that equals 1. So this one is the upper, and that one is the lower. Now, between 0 and 1, we don't have many options there. We have positive 1 half. So y1 at x equals 1 half is... Okay, so 1 half raised to the third power is 1 eighth, and then minus 4 times 1 half, so that's minus 2. 1 eighth minus 2 well that becomes 1 eighth minus 16 eighths so that's negative 15 eighths. And then y2 at x equals 1 half. So if we go up here, 1 half squared is 1 fourth. So this is negative 1 fourth minus half of 2 is 1. So negative 1 fourth minus 4 fourths is negative 5 fourths. five-fourths is negative ten-eighths. So this one now is smaller. Negative fifteen-eighths is smaller, more negative than negative five-fourths. So this is now the lower, and that one's the upper. <clears throat> so we're going to have to split this up into two problems. This one is going to be the integral from negative 2 to 0 of the upper function, which is y1 minus, and then you subtract the lower function, 
this one here is going to have to be the integral between 0 and 1 of the upper function, which is y2 minus y1. And then we have to add these two results. So this turns in to negative 2 to 0. y1 is x cubed minus 4x, and then we subtract negative x squared minus 2x. So that's x cubed. That's going to be plus x squared. And then minus 2x. And we can just find the antiderivative of each term individually. So that's going to be x to the fourth, 4 plus x cubed over 3 minus x squared. And we're going to evaluate that from negative 2 to 0. At the upper limit, that's just going to be 0. And then at the lower one, that's going to be negative 2 to the fourth power. That's 16 fourths. Negative 2 to the third power is negative 8 thirds. And then negative 2 squared is 4. So that 0 minus 4 plus 8 thirds plus 4. The negative 4 and the positive 4 would cancel. We get 8 thirds. Now, this one is y2 minus y1, so that's negative x squared. What was y2? Minus 2x. And then we subtract x cubed uh, minus 4x. So that's negative x cubed minus x squared plus 2x. The antiderivative is going to be negative x to the fourth over 4 minus x cubed over 3 plus x squared. And then the fundamental theorem of calculus is from 0 to 1. So at the upper limit of 1, we're going to get 1 to the 4th power is 1, but then negative. So negative 1 fourth minus 1 third plus 1. And they subtract at the lower limit, which is 0. So this is negative 3 twelfths minus 4 twelfths plus 12 twelfths. So that's negative 7 twelfths plus 12 twelfths. That's 5 twelfths. So now we add those two results, 8 thirds plus 5 twelfths, 8 thirds, we can turn into twelfths, that's 32 twelfths plus 5 twelfths is 37 twelfths. And again, there's no reason you should be using a calculator for all of this, turn it into decimals, whatever you need to do. I just am doing this by hand so I don't have a calculator. Okay, number 12 is an application of uh, what we just did, finding the area bounded by two graphs. If we were to look at graphs of supply and demand, we've got our demand function here, and we've got our supply function here. So demand supply 
right here is the point of equilibrium. So we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have an x value there. And the vertical axis is price, so we have a price. Um, consumer and producer surplus would be the areas up here and the area there. So those are the areas we're going to try to find. Um, let's start with uh, consumer surplus. That's this area right here. That would be that top triangle. Um, so what we need to first find is that point of equilibrium where supply and demand meet. So set the two equations equal to each other. If we want to get all the x's on one side and just solve this equation. So just solving this equation, we're going to have 150 equals 1.5x. Dividing both sides by 1.5. It gives us 100. So the x value, or number of units, of equilibrium is x equals 100. Now we need to find a price. We can plug 100 into any of the supply or demand functions there to get the p-value. So if we plug in 100 into there, for example, we're going to get 130. If you add 50, that's 180. So price, price equals 180. Now consumer surplus, if we're going to find the area underneath demand and above, above that price point of $180, then we're going to be finding an integral from 0 to 100. The upper function is demand, which is 200 minus 0.2x, and then we subtract the lower function, which is 180. So this is 200 minus 180 is 20, so this is 20 minus 0.2x. So the antiderivative is 20x minus 0 0.2 Point two x squared over 2. And then point 0.2 divided by 2 is point 0.1. So we have 20x minus point 0.1 x squared. Now we apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if we have 20 and we plug 100 in for that x, that's 2,000. And then if we have 100 squared multiplied by 0 0.1, that's 1,000. So the consumer surplus is $1,000. Now, producer surplus would be the area below this price point of $180 and above the supply function here. So we're still going to find the definite integral from 0 to 100, but now the upper function is the price of 180, and now we subtract supply. So that's 180 minus 50 is 130 minus 1.3. So the antiderivative there is 130x minus 1.3x squared over 2. And then 1.3 divided by 2 is 
or 0 0.65 so this is 130 x minus 0.65 x squared applying the fundamental theorem of calculus we're going to have we're going to plug the 100 in first that's going to be 130 times 100 it's 13,000 and then we're still plugging it in here so we have 100 squared times 0.65 That's 6,500. Now this is just the antiderivative of, of the upper bound. 100, we still have to subtract the antiderivative of the lower bound. But since the lower bound is 0, we would just be subtracting 0. And it's the same thing here with this one. 2,000 minus 1,000 is the antiderivative of the upper bound, 100. Um, <clears throat> If we were to plug zero in for the x's, we're just subtracting zero. So now we've got 13,000 minus 6,500. And that's 6,500. Now there is another way, if supply and demand are linear functions, then the consumer and producer surplus, let me zoom in here, are going to be right triangles. So we've got that right triangle for consumer surplus. Um, if we wanted to figure out the area of a right triangle, we just need to use 1 half base times height. Um, so area here Let's get a different color. There we go. Area is one half of the base, which is 100. Base going from here to here uh, times the height. Now, this price point is 180, and the y intercept of the demand function is 200. So that's a distance of 20. So we have 50 times 20 which is a thousand, which is what we got for the consumer surplus right here. Now, the other one, producer surplus, it's the same thing, it's a right triangle, so we could find the area there as one half base times the height. Now the y-intercept, let's see, is 50 and it goes all the way up to 180. So that's 130. So half of 100 is 50 and 50 times 130 is 6,500. So if your supply and demand functions are linear, then Essentially, you're just finding the area of right triangles. You're welcome to use the geometric formula for the area of a right triangle, one-half base times height. Okay, getting into chapter 6, section 6.1, we learned integration by parts. It was, if you can set up the integral as an expression u multiplied by another expression dv, then the integral would be u times v minus the integral of v times du. So the two things we need to try to find in each of these expressions is what's going to be u and what's going to be dv. The guidelines for this, if you recall, u needs to be something whose derivative du is a more simple form. And dv, if you choose an expression for dv, it needs to be something that's easy to integrate. So um, right here in number 13, we've got two expressions, x multiplied by e to the negative 3x. One of these has to be u, the other one has to be dv. Now I'm going to let x 
be my u expression because when I take the derivative du then the derivative is just 1 dx and 1 is a more simple form of x so that's a pretty good choice for you now dv then would have to be the remaining expression e to the negative 3x dx so I need to find v v is the antiderivative which means I have to integrate I have to integrate e to the negative 3x um, in order to do this I need to write this as e to the u I need to do a little e to the u integration um, so this is a separate u than this u right here uh, so if I let u equal negative 3x then du is negative 3 dx so I'm going to find the integral of this I need to have a negative 3 in front which means I need to have a negative 1 third in front of that so that's getting kind of messy to see there let me write this with a little more room in order to find the antiderivative of e to the negative 3x I need to have it be negative 3e to the negative 3x so that I have my u and my du right there but in order to multiply by this negative 3 right here I need to multiply by a negative one third out in front so the antiderivative now of negative 3e to the negative 3x is e to the negative 3x the one third is just a coefficient so there's what I've got I've got my u my du, my dv, my v. So the integral, the original problem that we had can be rewritten as u times dv. So this now we can use integration by parts. Integration by parts says we've got to write u times v. minus the integral of v. Now v has a coefficient of negative one-third and I like to write those in front of the integral sign times du. So we've got u times v minus the integral of v times du. This is just integration by parts formula that we're using here. Um, there's not much we can do to simplify that expression. I'm just going to write it as negative one-third x e to negative three x plus one-third. And then we're back to this, the integral of <coughs> the e to the negative three x, but we already did that integral right there. And it turned out the integral was negative one-third e to the negative three x. So multiplying those two coefficients, we're going to have one ninth Okay, similar. We've got to choose a u and a dv. And we could say, all right, well, we could just let x equal u again but that means dv would have to be natural log of 4x and that's a pretty bad choice because there is no integral of natural log of 4x that's not very easy to integrate so I'm gonna rethink this here I'm gonna let u equal natural log of 4x and dv is gonna equal x dx now if we take the derivative of the natural log it's 1 over 4x multiplied by the derivative of 4x which is 4 so this equals 1 over x 
v is the antiderivative of dv. The antiderivative of x is x squared over 2. So the original problem we had right here was u, and that was dv. So we had u times dv. So we can write this as, according to the integration by parts formula, u times v. So natural log of 4x multiplied by x squared over 2 minus the integral of v. Now v is x squared over 2. Over 2 is the same thing as being divided by 2, which is the same as multiplying by 1 half. So I'm going to move the 1 half out front and just call this x squared. So there's v times du. du is 1 over x dx. So with this expression here, again, there's not much that can be done with that. I'm just going to write the x squared over 2 in front of the natural log. So we've got x squared over 2 times the natural log of 4x minus 1 half times the integral x squared times 1 over x is just x. And then the antiderivative here of x is x squared over 2. Then we can multiply the 1 half there with the other 1 half. We get a 1 fourth, or x squared over 4. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is look at this without a radical sign. So this is going to be x times x minus 3 to the 1 third. So we're going to do integration by parts. And the reason that, I mean, I know it specifically says use integration by parts. If the direction is just set to integrate, we wouldn't be able to do to use u substitution. Let me just illustrate this. If we want to do u substitution with the general power rule, then typically we let the inside function be our u. So we'd have u equals x minus 3. That means du is 1 dx. So the problem is we have that extra x right there that we can't account for. So u substitution using the general power rule doesn't work on this problem. We've got to use, use integration by parts. So we need to choose a u and a dv. I'm going to let x equal u and then dv is x minus 3 to the 1 third. Now the derivative of u, du, is just 1 dx. v is the antiderivative of dv. So if we integrate there, so v is the integral of dv, which is the integral of x minus 3 to the 1 third. We can integrate this just using the power rule. So x minus 3, we're going to add 1 to the exponent. So that's 4 thirds, and then we multiply that by the reciprocal 3 fourths. So setting this up, the integral well, let's just go right into it. The integral of x times x minus 3 to 1 third dx is u times v. So we've got x times v, which is 3 fourths x minus 3 to the 4 thirds minus the integral of v. Now v has a coefficient, so I'm going to write it out front. times du. Now du is just 1 dx or simply dx. This antiderivative we can simply use again the power rule. If we add 1 to 4 thirds we're going to get 7 thirds. And then if we multiply by the reciprocal, that's 3 sevenths.
and multiplying these two coefficients, we're going to have 9 28 of x minus 3 to the 7 thirds. So 6.2, I know I called it 6.2, it was really 8.1 of the UVU edition. It was a um, appendix at the end of the book. These antiderivatives are going to be found using partial fraction decomposition. So if we break this rational expression into its partial fractions, we need to factor the denominator. So x squared minus 4x minus 5, that's going to be x minus 5 and x plus 1. So since there's two factors that form that denominator, that means there's going to be two partial fractions. And using the techniques that were shown in class, you can rewrite this expression, get rid of the denominator of each of these by multiplying the whole expression by the lowest common denominator. So that would leave this. Now anyway, skipped a step, I just don't have a lot of room. What, what happens there is you take this whole expression and you multiply it by the lowest common denominator. When it multiplies here, the denominators cancel. When it multiplies here, the x minus 5s cancel, so a is left multiplying x plus 1. When it multiplies here, the x plus 1s cancel, so b is multiplying the x minus 5. That's what's going on there. Now, to solve this equation, remember we're not solving for x, we're solving for a and b, so it doesn't matter what x equals. The problem is we have one equation with two unknowns, a and b. So in order to solve this, we need to get rid of either a or b. Um, so the way that we do that is we let x equal a certain value. For example, if we let x equal negative 1, and I plug that in right there, negative, not right there, plug it in right here, then negative 1 plus 1 is 0, and 0 times a is 0. So a disappears, letting us solve for b. So the equation would become b times negative 1 minus 5, that's negative 6. If we divide both sides by negative 6, we get b equals negative 2 thirds. Now, we need to figure out what a equals, so I want to cancel b. I'm going to let x equal 5 for this one. If x equals 5, the equation is 4 equals 6a. Divide by 6, you get a equals positive 2 thirds. So the original problem that we started with can be rewritten as the antiderivative of 2 thirds over, what was it, x minus 5 plus negative 2 thirds over x plus 1. This is the a right here, and this is the b that we just found. And, and then we could separate this into two different <coughs> antiderivatives. So the antiderivative of 2 thirds over x minus 5 dx plus the antiderivative of negative 2 thirds over x plus 1 dx. Now the 2 thirds here is just a coefficient, so I'm going to move that to the front. So 2 thirds times the antiderivative of 1 over x minus 5. And the same thing, the negative 2 thirds is just a coefficient, so I'm going to pull it out front and call it 1 over x plus 1. And then this is simply the natural log, the, the antiderivative of du over u is what that turns out to be, because if this is u, x minus 5, then du is just 1 dx, which we have right there, 
So what I'm saying is that this is really that, which is just the natural log of u, and that's the formula I'm going to use for these. So we have 2 thirds times the natural log of x minus 5, and then we have minus 2 thirds, and this is the same thing, this is just the antiderivative, or the integral of du over u, which is the natural log of x plus 1. We need to do a similar thing here. We need to factor the denominator. It's x minus 2, x minus 3. So we're going to have two partial fractions. And if we do the same thing, if we take this whole equation and multiply it by the lowest common denominator, we're going to end up with the equation 2x plus 2x minus 3, rather. Equals a over x minus 3 plus b times x minus 2. Now, if I want to cancel that part of the equation, for example, so I could solve for b, I want x minus 3 to equal 0, so x has to equal 3. So if we let x equal 3 and I plug it in there, 2 times 3 is 6, 6 minus 3 is 3, so we get a 3. a cancels because 3 minus 3 is 0. Here, 3 minus 2 is 1, so 1 times b means b equals 3. Now, if I want to cancel b, I want to let x equal 2. If I plug in a 2 right there for x, 2 times 2 is 4, 4 minus 3 is 1. If I plug in a 2 right here, 2 minus 3 is negative 1. So a equals negative 1. So the original problem can be split up. This original problem here can be split up into its two separate partial fractions, a over x minus 2 plus b over x minus 3. And then we could write this as two separate antiderivatives. So the antiderivative of negative 1 over x minus 2 plus the antiderivative of 3 over x minus 3 do the same thing I did in the other problem, just take these numerators and treat them as coefficients. And then we have same thing going on. That's the antiderivative of du over u, which is just the natural log. Same old, same old. We just need to factor the denominator. Now we're going to have to have a 2x and an x. And in order to get the 12, let's see, we can have a 4 and a 3. So we've got 2x plus 3 and x plus 4. That means we have two partial fractions. If we solve that, or not solve it, but multiply each of those fractions by the lowest common denominator, then we end up with 5x equals a times x plus 4 plus b times 2x plus 3. Now, if I want to
cancel the a part of this, for example, I could let x equal negative 4, plugging it in there, would give me negative 20, a disappears, because negative 4 plus 4 is 0. Here, negative 4 plugged in for x gives us negative 8 plus 3, it's negative 5, so negative 5b, which means b equals 4. Now, if I want to cancel b, um, that means I need to figure out what makes 2x plus 3 equal to 0. So what makes 2x plus 3 equal to 0? Well, if you solve that equation, you're going to get negative 3 halves. So you're going to let x equal negative 3 halves for this one. If you plug that in here for x, you're going to get negative 15 over 2. If you plug it in here, you're going to get a times negative 3 halves plus 4. Now, That becomes negative 15 halves equals, let's see, 4 is 8 halves. 8 halves minus 3 halves is 5 halves. If you multiply both sides by, or divide by 5 halves, or you can multiply both sides by 2 fifths, that's going to be negative 15 over 5. So A equals negative 3. So the original problem is the antiderivative rather than one rational expression. It's the partial fractions a over 2x plus 3 plus b over x plus 4. And then we can separate that into two antiderivatives. Now I'm going to move that negative 3 this one is just going to be 4 times the natural log of x plus 4 I've got to think a little more carefully about this one we can still do du over u um, but if, if that's my u, 2x plus 3, then du is 2. So really what I need to have is a 2 right there. Now I can multiply by a 2 as long as I divide by 2 right out there. So now that becomes negative 3 halves times the integral of du over u, which is natural log of u. C. Okay, 6.4 was improper integrals that uses limits. So what we need to do is change this into a limit problem as b approaches infinity and then instead of going from the integral from 1 to infinity it's now 1 to b and then I'm going to switch this instead of radical notation I'm going to write it as x to the negative 1 fourth dx and that's just the general power rule you're going to add 1 to it so this is x to the 3 fourths and then we need to multiply that by four thirds and then the um, fundamental theorem of calculus is from 1 to b so with the upper bound we're going to have four thirds times b to the three fours and then we subtract at the lower limit which is 1 1 to the three fourths is 
one, and then one times four thirds is four thirds. So that antiderivative, remember, was in, we need to evaluate now the limit of that antiderivative, four thirds b to the three fourths minus four thirds. If we keep plugging in values for b that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then this whole expression just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we talked about this in class. This is behavior. Um, the two words we're looking for here is converges or diverges. Converges means that the value as b gets larger towards positive or negative infinity, the value converges to a single number. Diverges means it gets bigger, 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 or more negative and more negative, which either, whichever the case may be. Um, this diverges because this expression just, just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as b gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So we're going to turn this into another limit problem. The limit as b approaches infinity of the integral from 0 to b of e to negative 2x dx. Now, we can find the antiderivative of e to the negative 2x as long as there's a negative 2 there. In order to do that, we need a negative 2 or a negative 1 half right out there. So now we can find the antiderivative of that simply using the, the integral of e to the u is just e to the u times du. Or, sorry, the antiderivative of e to the u du is just e to the u. So we're going to have 1 half e to the negative 2x as our antiderivative. We're going to evaluate that from 0 to b. I'm going to need a little more room. So if we do the upper bound of integration, it's going to be negative 1 half times e to the negative 2b, and then we subtract at the lower bound. If we plug in a 0 for x, we're going to have e to the 0, which is 1, and then negative 1 half times 1 is negative 1 half. So we need to figure out what the limit is as b approaches infinity of negative 1 over 2e to the 2b plus 1 half. Now as we plug values in for b that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then the denominator itself is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but the numerator stays negative 1. So we have a fraction where the denominator is getting bigger, but the numerator isn't. What that means is the fraction itself, the whole fraction, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, converging towards 0. So this whole expression then becomes, as b gets sufficiently large, tending towards infinity, the expression becomes 0 plus 1 half. So the whole value of the expression is converging, or it converges to 1 half. Okay, number 21, we have uh, same thing. We're going to evaluate this improper integral by evaluating a limit. So now since the lower limit is negative infinity, I'm going to use A approaches negative infinity. And then the antiderivative, where the integral becomes from A to negative 1, and I'm going to switch it to be x to the negative fifth. The antiderivative of x to the negative fifth, or x to the negative five, is x to the negative four divided by negative four. We're going to evaluate that antiderivative from a to negative one. So <clears throat> the upper bound becomes negative 1 
So negative 4 over negative 4. And then we subtract at the lower bound a to the negative 4 over negative 4. Now, negative 1 to the negative 4 in the numerator, we don't like to have negative exponents, so I'm going to move that down to the denominator. So that becomes 1 over negative 4 times negative 1 to the positive 4 minus, same thing, we're going to do 1 over negative 4 times a to the positive 4. Now right here, negative 1 to the positive 4, that's just 1. And then 1 times negative 4 is negative 1 4, so we have negative 1 4 plus, because we have minus a negative right there, <coughs> 1 over a to the 4th. Now let me erase this equal sign. Because what we're doing now that we have this antiderivative, if you recall, we need to now we evaluate the limit as a approaches negative infinity. So what we're doing is plugging in values there for a that are getting more and more negative. But what happens when you raise a negative base to a positive exponent is it comes out positive. So what's happening with this expression there, a to the negative or a to the fourth is it's getting larger and larger and larger, even though a is negative because the exponent is positive. So uh, the denominator is growing without bound, the numerator stays fixed at one. So as with uh, this problem here, this part of the expression converges to zero. So the whole expression converges to negative one-fourth. All right, the rest of these problems are just the anti-differentiation or finding the antiderivative. And it's up to, it's up to, uh, to you to decide which technique to use. Is it gonna be uh, integration by substitution? And remember, substitution could be general power rule, it could be exponential rule or the logarithm rule. Uh, is it going to be integration by parts, or is it going to be integration using partial fractions? <clears throat> As a general rule of thumb, first one to try would be substitution rule, either by uh, general power rule, exponential rule, or the logarithm rule. I think those are the most straightforward and the easiest. So that's going to be our default. For example, number 22, I notice we have e to a power, so we could try the exponential rule, which means that the power would be our u substitution, so u equals 3x to the third minus 4 du then becomes 9x squared dx. So we've got x squared dx, and uh, mentioned a couple of times in class, um, if the variable and the exponent match, um, but the coefficient doesn't, that's fine. You can you can mess around with the coefficient to make it work. For example, 45 could be 9 times 5. And then we've got the 9x squared. So 5 times 9x squared e to the 3x cubed minus 4 can be rewritten as 5 times the antiderivative of e to the u du. And then the antiderivative of e to the u, du, is just e to the u. And then u was 3x cubed minus 4. <clears throat> now notice we have similar thing there. We have e to a power. So we could try u substitution as we did with the last problem, which means u would be the exponent, 3x. And then d would be 3 dx. We've got the dx, but we have this x squared that's not accounted for in du. 
So U substitution isn't going to work on this. So the, uh, the other option, if you have one expression being multiplied with another expression, oftentimes you can do integration by parts, which means we need to try to get a U and a DV. U needs to be an expression whose derivative is more simple. So I'm going to let U equal X squared because DU is 2X. If you decrease by, a, if you decrease by powers, this is a secondary polynomial, this is a first degree polynomial, that's considered becoming more simple. So D was more simple. DV then would have to be the other factor of the product E to the 3x dx. Now we've got to find V. V is the antiderivative of DV, meaning it's the antiderivative of E to the 3x dx. Well, in order to find that, let me just write it this way. We need to find the antiderivative of e to the 3x. The only way we can do that is if we had a 3 here and then a 1 -third in front. Now, let me explain that a little more in detail. If I want to find the antiderivative of e to the 3x, that means I need to do a mini u substitution here. U is equal to 3x, which means du is 3 dx. I've got the dx, but I'm missing the 3, so I need to multiply by a 3 there, and then divide or multiply by 1 third out in front. <clears throat> and then 1 third times the antiderivative of 3e to the 3x becomes 1 third times the antiderivative of e to the u, and the antiderivative of e to the u is e to the u, and u is 3x. So there's your antiderivative, one-third e to the 3x. And now you really, it's up to you to remember the um, <clears throat> integration by parts formula. It's u v minus the integral of v du. So u times v minus the integral of v, and since v has a coefficient, I'm going to write it out there, times du. Now we need to find the antiderivative of this expression. So um, this is one of these 5% problems that you don't see very often, but it does happen every now and again. When you get to this point, you end up needing to do integration by parts again. And, and the reason that that has to be is if we try to differentiate this, um, we could let u equal 3x and then du would be 3 dx, and then we have this extra variable there that we can't account for. So we need to do another integration by parts, which means we need to choose another u and another dv. So I'm going to let u equal 2x and dv equal e to the 3x. So now du is x sorry, is <laughs> 2, and then V, we've already done this one, it's 1 third E to the 3x. So writing this, first part we can just rewrite as x squared times 1 third E the 3x minus 1 third and now this the integral of e to the 3x times 2x dx that's what we're going to expand using another integration by parts so we need a u times v 
minus the integral of v times du. Now, we've got another coefficient here, 2, so I'm actually going to write that in front. Instead of multiplying by 1 third, I'm going to multiply by 2 thirds. <clears throat> this integral we've done several times. The integral of e to the 3x is 1 third e to the 3x. So we've got x squared times 1 third e to the 3x minus 1 third times 2x times 1 third e to the 3x minus 2 thirds. And then the antiderivative here, remember, is 1 third e to the 3x. So simplifying this, x squared times 1 third e to the 3x, if I want to distribute that 1 third into the parenthesis there, whoop. <clears throat> and then we've got 2 thirds, actually, let's try this. One third and the two and the one third there are all going to multiply, so we're going to have two thirds times one third, that's two ninths x e to the three x minus. Now we've got that two thirds makes two ninths multiplied by this one third is two twenty sevenths e to the three x plus c. Now, since this one is already in the form of a rational expression, we could try to get it into this form. Because if you recall, that's just the natural log of u. So that's what we're going to try. So that means we're going to let u equal our denominator. And then du is its derivative. And this works out perfectly. 4x dx is du. So we can write this without manipulating anything as du over u. So this equals the natural log of u, which is the natural log of 2x squared minus 1. Actually, those need to be in absolute values. Now 25, it is in the form of a fraction, um, but the reason that we don't want to try to do du over u is because we have an inside function and an outside function. Oftentimes when we have an inside and an outside function, we can try to do u substitution with the general power rule. But first I'm going to rewrite this to have uh, so that we don't have a rational expression. I don't like the fraction there. So I'm going to move this term up to the denominator, or sorry, up to the numerator. By giving it a negative exponent. So now I've got this inside expression there. I'm going to let that be u. So then du is 3x squared dx. So the x squared and the dx match. What doesn't match is the coefficient, but that's fine, because 6, I can change that into a 3 in front and a 2 outside. So now I've got my 3x squared dx, which can become du, and this can become u. So this becomes u to the negative 3 times du. And the antiderivative of u to the negative 3 is u to the negative 2 divided by negative 2. And 
and then the twos can cancel leaving it negative u to the negative two which is negative one over u squared Okay, number 26, x squared times the natural log of x. Um, oftentimes when you have an expression that's a product, a product meaning one factor multiplied by another factor, and one of the factors is the natural log of something, oftentimes that ends up being integration by parts. So we need to use a u and a dv. It wouldn't make sense to make dv the natural log of x because there is no antiderivative or there's no simple antiderivative for that. So we're going to let u equal the natural log of x, which works out well because the derivative of natural log, remember, is 1 over x. And that's more simple. 1, one over x is more simple than natural log of x, which means that dv is x squared. So when you, anti, when you take the antiderivative, you get x cubed over 3. So now we use the uh, integration by parts formula, which is u times v minus the integral of v, and v is x cubed over 3, or 1 third x cubed. So there's v times du so that's natural log of x x cubed times 1 over x is x cubed over x, or x squared. And then the antiderivative of x squared is x cubed over 3. So we have natural log of x times x cubed over 3 minus x cubed over 9 plus c. I notice right off the bat in number 27 we have an inside function and an outside function and like I said often not always but often that's an indication of general power rule so we're gonna try that when u equals the inside function du is simply the derivative and so we've got the x squared dx which is perfect if we have exponents that match um, we can we can work around getting coefficients that match. 30, for example, was 15 and 2. So we can make the u substitution now and call this u to the fifth power and the antiderivative is u to the 6 over 6, which is u to the 6, because the 2 and the 3, or the 2 and the 6 cancel the 1 third. So this is the answer there. Now I notice on 28 that it's in the form of a rational expression, so we could try to do du over u like we did on the last page, um, which means u would be x squared plus 2x minus 3, du would be 2x plus 2 dx. The problem is we're not going to be able to get 2x plus 2 and 7x plus 1 to match. So we're not going to be able to do du over u, so integration using the logarithm rule isn't going to work. There's no inside or outside expression, so we can't do general power rule. Um, I can't really move 
the denominator up to the numerator to try to use integration by parts. So this is going to be an example of um, partial fraction decomposition. We're going to need to write this as a over something plus b over something. Now the denominator can factor into x plus 3, x minus 1. So the problems that we did uh, before, we would multiply this whole expression by the lowest common denominator, which is x plus 3 times x minus 1. What happens there is then we would end up with 7x plus 1 equals a times x minus 1 plus b times x plus 3. Now we're solving for a and b, so we can let x equal whatever we want. So I'm going to let x equal 1, because if I plug that in there, I get 1 minus 1, which is 0. So a disappears, allowing me to solve for b. So when x equals 1 and I plug it in there, I get 7 plus 1, which is 8. When I plug it in there, I get 0 times a, which is 0. Plug it in there, I get 1 plus 3, which is 4b. So b equals 2. Now I want to let x equal negative 3 because when I plug it in there, I get negative 3 plus 3, which is 0. I'm going to let b disappear. So when I plug it in there, I get negative 21 plus 1. It's negative 20. Plug it in there, I get negative 3 minus 1. That's negative 4a. So a equals 5. So this is really the antiderivative of both of those separate partial fractions. So it's the antiderivative of 5 over x plus 3 dx plus the antiderivative of 2 over x minus 1 dx. And that 5 I can move in front as a coefficient. Same thing with that 2. And now we've got an example of du over u, which again is the natural log of u. So this is 5 times the natural log of x plus 3 plus 2 times the natural log of x minus 1 plus c. Okay, finally we've got last one here, the antiderivative of natural log of x. I've said it a couple times in this video that there is no antiderivative of natural log of x. Um, there's no quick formula for it. We can find it, but this is going to be integration by parts. Natural log of x is one of the factors, and dx is the other factor. So that's going to be our u and our dv. u is going to be the natural log of x, and dv is going to be 1 dx. Derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x, and the antiderivative of 1 is x. So now we use integration by parts formula, u times v minus the integral of v times du. And then the x's here would cancel, so that's just the antiderivative of 1 dx. And the antiderivative of 1 dx is x. Now, just let me make you aware of a few common mistakes I see here. First of all, these x's cannot multiply together to be x squared because this x is inside of a natural log. These x's can't subtract from each other because this this x here is part of that factor, or sorry, is part of that is a factor of that product. So the more common way of writing this is to move that x in front and to write this as x times the natural log of x minus x plus c.